Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 2020 uh, Dean's Cup. The Dean's Cup is Duke Law's premier oral advocacy competition that is uh, hosted by the Moot Court Board, and uh, two L's and three L's participate. This year, we were able to have 30 participants enter the Dean's Cup, and we narrowed that down to eight semifinalists, and uh, we've been left with the lucky two we have here today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank a few individuals. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the Dean's Office, uh, Professor Andrew Sear, Professor Metzloff, the Clerkship Office, and the Events Office, who have all been uh, very instrumental in putting the Dean's Cup together. I'd also like to uh, thank the faculty and staff who, and the local community practitioners who donated their time to judging the Dean's Cup, because without them, the Dean's Cup would not at all be possible, because the Dean's Cup is exclusively judged by uh, faculty, staff, and practitioners. Uh, our biggest thank you goes to the judges uh, who you can read about in your programs. Today we have the Honorable Patricia Millett from the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. We have the Honorable Johnny Rawlinson from the Ninth Circuit. And we also have the Honorable Amy St. Eve from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's get started. All right, so this year's problem is Manning v. Caldwell. At issue in Manning is a Virginia statute that permits the civil interdiction of habitual drunkards, which then subjects individuals to criminal statutes restricting the possession and consumption of alcohol. The plaintiffs, respondents here tonight, are homeless individuals living in Virginia with alcoholism. The questions presented are one, whether Virginia's statute permitting civil interdiction of habitual drunkard habitual drunkards violates the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment, and two, whether habitual drunkards is unconstitutionally vague in violation of the 14th Amendment. We do ask that while arguments are ongoing, please remain in your seats, silence your phones, and refrain from talking. Enjoy. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. We are here to hear argument in the case of Caldwell versus Manning. Will counsel for appellant please approach and proceed? Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Donovan Stone, counsel for the petitioner, the Commonwealth of Virginia. With the court's permission, I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Certainly. Thank you. Your honors, drinking alcohol is a privilege, not a right. And the Commonwealth of Virginia has chosen to deny that privilege to drunk drivers, moonshiners, bootleggers, and habitual drunkards. That prohibition is a reasonable exercise of Virginia's broad authority to regulate alcohol policy within its borders. Accordingly, petitioners respectfully request that this court reverse the judgment below for two reasons. First, <coughs> ordinary citizens exercising ordinary common sense understand the meaning of habitual drunkard. And second, it does not inflict cruel and unusual punishment to prosecute individuals for their harmful conduct. Now, to the first point, Your Honors, the Virginia Court of Appeals recognized the common sense nature of the term habitual drunkard more than a decade ago in Jackson v. Virginia. Mr. Stone, you, it's hard to tell from your brief. Are you disputing the quasi-criminal nature of this statute? Are you arguing it's purely civil? Yes, Your Honor, this statute is purely civil, uh, and that is because no criminal policy or no criminal penalties follow from an interdiction order. But without the criminal penalties that are attached to the second portion of it, doesn't it, isn't it meaningless? Well, no, Your Honor. Uh, ultimately, the interdiction order is a self-enforcing economic bar, and so an individual who is interdicted is then prohibited from buying alcohol, and Virginia's state-owned liquor stores and other stores that sell alcohol are prohibited from selling alcohol 
doesn't the whole proceeding of becoming interdicted indicate that it really is quasi-criminal? It's done in front of a judge by state prosecutors, has criminal consequences. Wouldn't that at least make it quasi-criminal? Well, no, Your Honor. Uh, the civil interdiction proceeding uh, may be adjudicative, but many uh, civil proceedings do seem somewhat uh, criminal-like, but that does not render something quasi-criminal. However, even if the statute were quasi-criminal, it would still uh, receive only reasonable uh, review for reasonable clarity. Well, it's, it's not just that you have a purchase limitation once you're adjudicated a habitual drunkard. It's suddenly you are subject to arrest, as some of these plaintiffs have been, 10, 20 times just for being in the same park as a can of beer <coughs> or in a Walmart store where wine is sold. And so why doesn't that? distinguish this case from others and make it clearly quasi-criminal and its consequences? Well, Your Honor, those issues would ultimately get to the prosecution of whether or not, whether or not an individual, uh, whether or not there was probable cause for an individual to be prosecuted or arrested, and so that would really get into but a... But you don't dispute that. that there was probable cause in the two instances I referenced, which come from this exact case. I didn't hear you confessing error in your brief. Well, Your Honor, it's unclear from the record whether or not there was probable cause, and respondents have not pled a Fourth Amendment. Well, it's an attempted possession, and so I suppose it, it seems like when someone is in the vicinity of uh, alcohol, they've been arrested. I mean, you don't dispute those facts, do you? You can't for purposes of this stage of the proceeding. Well, no, Your Honor. Uh, of course, okay. these individuals can be... And you didn't dismiss those prosecutions. No, the state, you didn't dismiss them. Well, the, the record does not state whether or not these individuals were prosecuted. It mm -hmm. does say that they were arrested. Uh, and so we do not know whether or not they were actually prosecuted. That's not clear from the record. Uh, mm -hmm. However, constructive possession is a very uh, normal standard, Your Honor. Uh, and individuals are frequently uh, arrested for being in constructive possession of firearms, for example. But this is what happens once you're adjudicated a habitual drunkard. This entire world of criminal prosecution and perpetual criminal responsibility, at least for folks that are um, alcoholics who cannot control their behavior, they're perpetually in a state of violation just waiting to be arrested. Respectfully, Your Honor, I would push back against that characterization. This uh, interdiction order is not perpetual. Individuals can petition the state uh, to have an interdiction order amended or canceled. No, but as long as they're covered by it. I mean, you can get it amended or canceled if you're no longer subject to the disease that these plaintiffs are subject to which they're subject. But if they're still suffering from their disease, then they are in a state of perpetual culpability and they're just waiting to be arrested, it seems like. Is that, is that wrong? Uh, well, Your Honor, ultimately, uh, petitioners do recognize that these individuals do have a disease and they are a vulnerable member or vulnerable members of our society. Uh, however, Virginia is within its rights to take a hard line stance on continued alcohol abuse. Is that a yes or no to my question? I'm sorry. Well, yes, Your Honor, these individuals are in a perpetual state of culpability just waiting to be arrested. Well, no, Your Honor, they're not in a perpetual state of culpable uh, of culpability. They are not prosecuted until they have committed some sort of harmful act. No, but doesn't, doesn't, and doesn't the record support the justice's question? Because they've been arrested 20, 30 times for the same thing. Well, yes, Your Honor, these individuals have been arrested multiple times for public intoxication and for violating their interdiction orders. Not only for public intoxication, but for also constructive possession, which is a very broad concept. Well, yes, Your Honor, however, that broad concept does not turn this statute into a quasi-criminal statute. Why not? Well, ultimately, Your Honor, because it is entirely civil, and the as I, sta as I stated How earlier... How can it be entirely civil if there have been this number of arrests? Well, Your Honor, uh, it is entirely civil because prosecution does not necessarily follow an interdiction order. However, uh, respondents or petitioners submit that even if this law were quasi-criminal, or even criminal for that matter, it would not be unconstitutionally vague. And that is because the statute provides fair notice to individuals and adequately limits law enforcement discretion. How, how does it provide fair notice? What is the definition of an habitual drunkard? A habitual drunkard, as uh, Jackson recognized, is uh, an individual who is in the continual habit of being intoxicated from alcohol. And what does continual mean? Well, Your Honor, continual, well, as an initial matter, Your Honor, uh, the 
due process clause does not require that uh, a law state with mathematical precision what is being required. However, we do know in the continual habit definition that an individual whose continued alcohol abuse renders them a risk of harm to the public or themselves is a habitual drunkard. Well, the problem is it must give reasonable notice to an individual as to what conduct is being prohibited and continual to one person may mean one thing and to another person may mean another thing. So how are we to uh, conclude that the Commonwealth has given notice of how one will know if he or she is in a continual state of drunkenness? Well, Your Honor, uh, ultimately uh, due process does not require, as I stated, mathematical precision. In fact, this law is- I don't think anyone's asking for mathematical precision. We're asking for a functional definition. Well, Your Honor, uh, petitioners submit that the continual definition is functionally adequate, and that is because... Well, do you do they have to constantly be in this state? No, Your Honor. One well, is isn't not, that what continual means? These individuals aren't constantly intoxicated, but they certainly constantly pose a risk of harm to the public or themselves. Okay. What, if they're, what if they're intoxicated once a week? Is that continual? Uh, even if they were getting intoxicated once a week, that may or may not be continual intoxication, but it is... A wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. May or may not be... What kind of answer is that? Well, Your Honor, the point here is to focus on the fact that these individuals uh, are, in fact, a continued risk of harm. Again, we're trying to ask you what you mean by continued. Do you mean every day? Do you mean regularly every weekend or once a week, as our Chief Justice asked? I mean constant. These individuals are constantly... Okay, so constant, to me, in the definition would mean 24-7. Yes, Your Honor. These individuals, through their continued alcohol abuse, are constantly... Uh, so the statute only applies to people who are drunk 24-7? No, Your Honor. Not individuals who are drunk 24-7. Oh, they're alcoholics 24-7? No, Your Honor. And they're homeless 24-7. Is that what you mean? That is not at all what I mean, Your Honor. This statute does not... As an initial matter, the term habitual drunkard is not a proxy for homeless alcoholic. Now, certainly there may be some overlap. It may be true that uh, all habitual drunkards are alcoholics, but not all alcoholics are going to be habitual drunkards. All of the plaintiffs here are homeless, aren't they? Yes, Your Honor. And that's what the class, the purported class is. Yes, Your Honor. However, I... So go on, tell me. I'm still rather baffled as to the definition here. Well, Your Honor, the term habitual drunkard applies to individuals whose continued alcohol abuse threatens harm. That's constant... What harm? Uh, a risk of harm to the public or themselves. What's the harm? I know you used that phrase in your brief, but then I never heard. What is uh, what is the the record here for, say, Mr. Manning? What threat to the public has he been? Well, Your Honor, the key is that is a threat. It is a threat to the public or oneself. An in, any individual who is drinking to excess in the at the rate at which respondents drink are certainly posing a harm, a risk of harm to themselves. Where is the risk of harm coming from? That's not in the definition. That's not in the <clears throat> statute. Where are you pulling that from? Well, the statute requires that an individual to have shown to have shown himself to be a habitual drunkard, and one can only do that through uh, his own harm. Where what is that coming from? That? Is that, mm -hmm. What's the case authority you're relying upon for that proposition? Well, Your Honor, Jackson's definition, or J the Jackson decision that I referenced earlier, clearly is uh, fundamentally about a risk of harm. The, the court in Jackson, the Virginia Court of Appeals, uh, is frequently referring to Virginia's broad authority to regulate alcohol policy in order to protect public safety. Where is the phrase risk of harm used in that case? The phrase risk of harm is not uh, is not actually used in that case. Uh, however, the Virginia Court of Appeals did recognize that this statute recognizes or represents a legislative judgment that individuals who are incapable of conforming their conduct to societal norms should be forbidden from purchasing or using alcohol. How can we tell that from a plain reading of the statute? Well, Your Honor, a plain reading of the statute requires looking at the statute as a whole, and you'll see that uh, habitual drunkards are not the only category of interdiction. Uh, other categories can also be interdicted, including drunk drivers, <coughs> moonshiners, bootleggers, and then, of course, habitual drunkards. Uh, and the common thread between those four categories is that they all contemplate some sort of risk of harm. Uh, the Sixth Circuit in the Whitaker case actually recognized this a few years ago when it held that the term habitual drunkard applies to alcoholics engaged in harmful conduct. Uh, it did so because the term habitual drunkard, as used in the Immigration Nationality Act, was grouped with drug smugglers, human traffickers, and felons. And so the same logic applies here. And now, because the term habitual drunkard is not merely a proxy for a homeless alcoholic, 
uh, Virginia has not criminalized a status in violation of this court's Eighth Amendment jurisprudence. Why aren't we giving the circuit courts here too much discretion to really legislate and determine on an individual case as what a habitual drunkard is? Well, Your Honor, these uh, state judges are, in fact, uh, undertaking individualized and fact-bound uh, assessments of whether or not an individual is a habitual drunkard. However, that does not uh, transform a law into being unconstitutionally vague. In fact, we normally and regularly require <coughs> that individuals uh, that individuals uh, comply with normative standards like reasonable care, negligence, or drunken disorderly conduct. But counsel, isn't the fact that there are individualized determinations mean that there is no reasonable notice given if the definition isn't refined until the court determines on an individualized basis what the uh, state is of the individual who's being reduced at? No, Your Honor. And as, as a brief analogy, I'll say that an individual who is told that they are skating on thin ice can't then cry foul play when they're not told exactly where they're going to fall in. Uh, and so the law normal the, the law regularly requires individuals to comply with normative standards. Well, but the difficulty here is that we are having some trouble pinning down what that normative standard is when we can't agree on a definition of what is continual. Well, Virginia has provided a definition, and uh, this court has has stated regularly that a state court interpreting a state law should defer, or excuse me, a federal court. Uh, should defer to a state court's interpretation of a state law. And Jackson has decided that this law is not unconstitutionally vague. And what is the definition that the Virginia State Court has given us of continually um, a drunkard, being a continual habitual drunkard? What is the definition that the state has come up with? The state has decided that an individual who is in the continual habit of being intoxicated from alcohol is a habitual drunkard. The Ninth Circuit recently recognized as well that one who drinks in excess is a habitual Are they given a definition of continual? Well, is that, Your Honor? Is there a definition of continual? Uh, no, Your Honor, there is not. Isn't that pretty important? No, Your Honor, the due process does not require that every single term in a statute or every single term in a judicial opinion be defined. And no, 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 but they, they can't be subject to ar arbitrary enforcement either. They can't also be an empty vessel into which anyone can pour whatever findings they wish in the case. You would agree with that, correct? That is absolutely true, Your Honor. Okay, and then so if continual can mean, it uh, doesn't mean continual when I look it up in a dictionary because it doesn't mean 24-7, or it wouldn't, it's not limited to 24-7, and you couldn't tell us whether someone who is constantly, perpetually drunk every weekend but not during the work week, is a continual drunkard. Can you, t can you answer that question from the definitions that the state court has given you or that the statute gives you? That individual would be on notice that uh, he could be prosecuted as a habitual drunkard. No, 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 no. That, look, as far as I can tell right now, we're all on notice that we could be prosecuted because if, you, if we drink alcohol at all because there seems to be no content to this continual requirement. Uh, well, Your Honor, uh, the, con the continual requirement, again, applies to individuals, and in this is the focus here. It is an individual who is constantly posing a risk of harm. It is not someone who is... And what harm? The harm is uh, alcohol abuse, Your Honor, and the Virginia... So this seems to go in a circle. So the harm is that you're continually drunk, and so we have to protect you against being continually drunk, but nobody knows... The harm has no more meaning than the status since we don't know what continual means. How do I know it's a harm if I don't know what continual means? How do you know if it's a harm if you don't know what I don't know what continual means? means. Well, Your Honor... Uh, this means the weekends. Continual, Your Honor, ultimately is a normative standard, and petitioners do submit and... It's a normative? It sounds like a temporal standard to me. Well, Your Honor, uh, it is normative in the sense that, uh, that individuals... It's made up as they go along? No, Your Honor, it's not made up as they go along, and the state court judge is going to undertake an individualized and fact-bound uh, in, uh, in inquiry into whether or not someone is a habitual drunkard. Now, briefly, I would like to use my one minute left <laughs> to discuss the Eighth Amendment issue, and there is no limiting principle to respondents' Eighth Amendment theory. Uh, now, the fourth is alcoholism a status you couldn't punish. Uh, you, you agree you can't punish alcoholism. You cannot status. punish anyone for being an alcoholic. No, you're correct. Right. And can you punish someone for being homeless? Uh, yeah, no, Your Honor. No, but if you put the two together, 
Well, these, indivi the statute. these individuals are not being punished for being homeless alcoholics. These individuals are being punished for harmful conduct. And be an alcoholic in public, which is just another way of saying be an alcoholic without any home other than the public streets. This statute does not apply only to homeless alcoholics. This would, statute apply yes, would all homeless alcoholics be habitual drunks? No, Your Honor. Only individuals who have been uh, interdicted as a state court because they pose a risk of harm to the public. And so it would not be all homeless alcoholics. So it's your position that just being a homeless alcoholic doesn't Honor, pose a risk? I, I see that I've run out of time. May I briefly conclude? Yes, please. No, Your Honor. Just being a homeless alcoholic does not mean that you pose a risk of harm to the public. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, counsel. Madam Chief Justice, may it please the court. Good evening. My name is Zeke Starr, attorney for the respondent, Mr. Manning. Today's case is about ensuring that a state cannot shackle an individual because of the symptoms of their disease or cloak that action behind a vague and archaic law. Don't we have to overrule Powell versus Texas to rule for you? No, Your Honor, I don't believe we do. And I think there's two reasons for it. First, I think that we have to look at Powell for the fact that there is no binding precedent from that because we have a plurality opinion. Is that how we've cited that case since it was decided? I think <coughs> no, we've Your cited Honor. the plurality opinion. Yes, Your Honor, and that's been cited for several propositions, but the proposition that Powell dealt with in its actual holding was that when we're talking about a generally applicable law, that there's no specific defense to that law if you happen to be an alcoholic. And that's distinct from this case in several ways because we're not talking about a generally applicable law. We're talking about a law that is only applied to a specific subset of people who happen to have a condition. And that's distinct in that sense because of that. So we're talking about a different conduct here. Can we find for you based solely on Robinson or do we have to accept your interpretation of Powell to do so? Uh, Your Honor, I believe that we can, you can hold uh, for me just because of Ro uh, Robinson. How would that be? Because Robinson really focuses on status versus acts. Yes, Your Honor. And the first, how would that be? Yes, sir. I, well, I think for two reasons. I think first, the fact that it can't specifically mean only, uh, it can't be a drafting rule. It can't just mean that only if you just define status, there's always going to be some acts that relate to that. It, it can't be a bright line rule like petitioner suggests, because if that were the case, then we'd be talking about a law that would hinge on a constitutional distinction between being a narcotic addict who walks on the street and just being a narcotic addict who's arrested while standing on the street. That can't be a functional difference that the Eighth Amendment recognizes. And I think the second part is actually something uh, that one of the justices asked before on the petitioner's argument, which is that it leaves uh, respondents in a state of continual, uh, perpetual culpability. Uh, in, in essence, because they are criminalized in every element of their disease, what they're left with is an instance where they can be arrested at any time. And, and that denies them the human dignity that the Eighth Amendment guarantees. But the rationale from Powell was that, I mean, I'm not sure I agree that we could rule on Robinson and ignore Powell because the distinction there was that there was an exercise, there was an action in public. The being in public while having that status was what was made the, all the difference in that case. It was that public presence for um, the alcohol there as well. Um, and so it seems very similar here. And the homelessness could be caused by many things separate and apart from the alcoholism. And so the fact that they are homeless doesn't mean that we are punishing them for the mere direction of their disease, but in fact, just as in Powell, they have a disease, but what they haven't controlled, maybe they can't control that, but what they have not controlled is being in public. Yes, sir, and I think the distinction here is that in Powell, it was a public intoxication statute that applied to anyone, regardless of their status. So if I had walked out uh, with a beer in my hand, I could have been uh, arrested the same way as Mr. Powell was. It doesn't matter whether or not I'm an alcoholic. Isn't that true here? Uh, no, Your Honor, because Virginia has singled out people who have a specific condition, they've gone through a process where they interdict them, and they single them out, and they make them criminal. Do they only interdict homeless people? 
Uh, no, Your Honor, but because they have uh, the majority uh, of the people. That well, that's very different than saying that only, the statute's only as to them. So if, in fact, they are also interdicting people who are not homeless, it seems to me we're right back in Powell, where it applies sometimes to homeless people and sometimes not to homeless people. Yes, Your Honor. I, I think, again, the distinction is, is that everyone who's been interdicted, uh, given the what we have to assume the, the amount of alcohol consumption that is needed to be interdicted is uh, they may be, in fact, alcoholics. So they still have that status regardless of their homelessness. Yes, so, but then as in Powell, there, it's, it's the action of um, being in that condition in public, choosing not to keep it to yourself, but being in public where you are encountering individuals or traffic or are in a risk in a way that you aren't if you were sitting in your own home. Yes, it makes all the difference. Yes, sir, and I think I would point to Justice White's concurrence where he said that there are going to be some alcoholics who do not have a home, and they are compelled to drink because of their illness, and they have to drink somewhere. And, and, and that applies directly to the respondents we're talking about here. Yes, they, but what you have, and what I didn't read your complaint to allege is that, well, you said there can certainly be um, synergistic effects between alcoholism and homelessness, is that the homelessness is not something that's driven by their disease. And that whatever factors cause that, maybe someone was in an accident or medical issues or things like that or other family issues. But it seems to me that is not something that's caused by the disease. So punishing, punishing the fact that they were drunk in public seems exactly like Powell based on your complaint. Yes, Your Honor. I think if the law was that it just made it illegal to drink in public, then that might be the case. Not drink, to be drunk. To, to be drunk in public. But I think the distinction here is that's not what the law is here. It what is the law from your perspective? Your Honor, it's a law that criminalizes an individual in each aspect of their disease, the core symptomatic behavior that defines their status. They can't drink, they can't possess alcohol. But it's more than just their status. The, the status of being a habitual drunk may be determined up front, but that alone isn't what gets them arrested. It's the next step, the action taken, the possession of alcohol, the purchasing alcohol, or possession whether it's constructive or actual. So that is very similar to the Powell circumstance. Yes, Ron, I think the distinction would be that while there, at, there may be an action that takes place afterward, that is the symptomatic de definitional behavior. Uh, no one was insinuating in Powell that, um, that being an alcoholic requires that you go in public. The difference here is, is that all the actions that define their disease are only criminalized for them, not for anyone else. A and they're singled out because of that. And I think what if we replace this with a drug? addict, and the statute pertained to drug addicts instead of alcoholics, would you make the same argument? Your Honor, I think the distinction there would be that in Virginia it is illegal for everyone to, uh, to use a narcotic, if we're talking about you know heroin or something like that, like they were in Robinson. What about in states where marijuana is legal? Your Honor, I think that that would be a, a different question, but we'd have to still think about the fact that whether or not the element of uh, the interdiction was specifically targeting O only people that had some uh, disease or... If it was targeted toward a, a narcotic addict... Yes, Your Honor. ...which would be similar to an alcoholic... Yes, Your Honor. ...different drug, different choice. Would you differentiate between the two? Your Honor, I think that Robinson would say that that would probably be covered by Robinson in the sense that all that the state has done is break the Robinson opinion into two steps and have the same law in two steps the interdiction, and then the same prosecution. So, so is your argument that a similar statute could not be enforced against someone who was addicted to narcotic drugs? Your Honor, I, I think that it would be a closer question because th certainly there is a public harm component that's been recognized by this court and other courts in terms of narcotics use and narcotics trafficking. Uh, that's different here. Petitioner talked a lot about a public harm component, a personal harm component. That's just not present in the statute. Just use, yeah, just narcotics use, not trafficking, that's separate. But if somebody is addicted to drugs and they're homeless and the same statute applied and they're determined to be a habitual narcotics abuser, would you be making the same argument? And if not, how are you distinguishing alcoholism from an addict? Yes, Your Honor, if an individual was compelled or addicted to narcotics and in that state it was legal for people to use those narcotics, then we would be talking about the same law. The distinction here, because of that, that's the same element we're talking about because it is legal for everyone to do that. 
if we're talking about something that's illegal for everyone to do, that's a generally applicable law. So that's we're where you're drawing the line, whether the underlying conduct is legal or illegal. Yes, Ron, I think that's part of it. Of and I think the second part of that that But are you attacking just, the, imagine if the statute was just the interdiction provision that pro prohibited purchase of alcohol by people who have been adjudicated alcoholics or drunkards, whatever word you want to use. <coughs> if it was just the purchase prohibition, would you have an argument? You know, if I'm understanding the question, it would mm -hmm. only be a crime to purchase alcohol, not to possess or consume it. Right, so you did, yes, you wouldn't have, all, all they would do is say, there's a proceeding where you are no longer amongst those individuals who are allowed to buy alcohol in this, uh, in this state because you have shown uh, habitual abuse. Your Honor, I think that that probably would be a much tighter question, that there may actually... I, I get it's a different question. I'm just trying to get an answer to it based on the answer you just gave my colleague. Yes, Your Honor, I think that we... Are you challenging just that aspect of the statute by itself? No, Your Honor, I, I, I don't believe so, only because it's not going to attack the same human dignity. Right, but, but then you can't say, you can't answer questions by saying this is a statutory provision where everyone, where, where it is lawful for people to purchase alcohol, because in fact, it is not lawful for groups, whether they're under 21 or people who have been adjudicated uh, habitual drunkards, to purchase alcohol. And so it seems to me that your clients, once adjudicated, if you're not attacking the interdiction itself, then your, your clients are in the same position as the narcotics addicts because they've been determined under state law, which isn't challenged here, that they cannot purchase this. And yet they're purchasing it. And then being and demonstrating uh, that they've purchased it and consumed it um, through their behavior in public. Yes, sir, and if I'm understanding the question, I, I think that, again, the distinction is it's not just purchasing here. It, it's every element uh, of the person's disease. It's but that would be the same as a narcotics addict, would it not? Your Honor, I think it would be different because, again, it is also not illegal for anyone in the state to consume alcohol or to possess it is alcohol. It is very much illegal for groups of people in the state to consume or possess alcohol, and that would be, I, I assume, in the state people under 21. And, I, and, and as it turns out, people who are habitual drunkards, it's illegal as to them. Yes, Your Honor, and I think that that would go because there is some public harm interest uh, in the first two that's been recognized, that states can make it illegal for individuals under the age of 21. And I think that actually gets us to the vagueness question because the issue here is we don't really know whether there is some public harm element or not. And, and because petitioners are suggesting that, they're trying to ask this I'm court to guessing that their courts have said it, have they not? Have the state courts said that? Your Honor, the state, no state court has used the word harm, actually, in any of their opinions. And the only references uh, to any general public harm component in, in Jackson, what, which Petitioner mentioned, actually deals with the power of the state to regulate alcohol more generally. And, and nobody's challenging that. No one's saying that they can't have alcohol regulations. The they, state legislature here, though, has made a determination, which legislatures are supposed to do. They've made a policy decision that this class of individuals somebody who's a habitual drunk poses a risk of public harm or a risk to him or herself. Why should we step on the toes of the legislature and go into the policy area here that courts stay away from? Respectfully, Your Honor, there's nothing in the statute that identifies a harm component, so that's something that's being read in by the Commonwealth. Is there anything in the legislative history that does? Uh, Your, Honor, Your Honor, not that I'm aware of, and I think that actually there's evidence that shows that that wasn't the intent, because up until 1935, uh, Virginia actually had a uh, rehabilitative scheme, and they changed it. They changed it when they removed the due process uh, elements of a trial and different things like that. Uh, and that actually corresponds to a period in, in, in history where terms like habitual drunkard were used interchangeably with things like vagrant. <coughs> and that's what we should be concerned about here, because what we're talking about well, is... Well, how would your Eighth Amendment argument that you can't punish people based on compulsive behavior they can't control... How would that apply to a pedophile who's watching child porn, and let's say it's first rule child porn, so you can't rely on the harm to the child? Yes, Ron, I think the distinction here again is that it is a general state law that makes it illegal for anyone uh, to, to engage in uh, watching. But, the, but for your Eighth Amendment argument, that's all about we cannot punish people. The Eighth Amendment prohibits punishing people for conduct they cannot control. No, Your Honor, I think the distinction is, is that it, punish, it prevents the singling out and criminalization of an individual's entire condition or status, and it, it prevents that when we're talking about an individual who 
who is singled out from the rest of the population. I don't think that's the same. The pedophile is not single. Oh, go ahead. Counsel, are you raising your vagueness challenge on behalf of your clients or, or on behalf of others who may be interdicted under this statute? The, the, we're challenging the statute itself, Your Honor. Uh, on the behalf of your clients or others? Uh, on behalf of our clients and, and... Do you have standing to challenge the statute on vagueness grounds on behalf of your clients? Yes, Your Honor. How do they have standing? If the, if the <coughs> Is it disputed that their conduct falls within the language of the statute? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I believe it is, and I think that we should look to how this court has dealt with other vagrancy laws. There's simply no core example here uh, for us to look at. There was a conversation that this panel had with Petitioner for almost 10 minutes where we could not discern what the definition was, what the core case was. So if this court can't figure it out, then somebody with common sense walking down the street certainly won't. There's no question that your clients fall within any definition of habitual drunkard. Your Honor, I believe there is, I think, for two reasons. First, because there is no evidence on, on how, how my clients were interdicted in the first place. We don't know what level but of given the, We're right. not talking about evidence at this stage. We're talking about what you've pled. It's a 12B6 motion yes, to dismiss. And I think that... And you've alleged, despite what, what, why they were found to be habitual drunks, you've alleged that they have a craving to use alcohol, that they pathologically pursue alcohol use, that they've been unable to maintain sobriety under any circumstances, wouldn't they fall within habitual drunks? Your Honor, I think the distinction that we have to look at here is that they would not because there is no core example. For instance, when we're talking about vagrancy laws or loitering laws that this court has struck down before, this court didn't hinge its decision on the fact that, for instance, somebody was in fact standing on the street. Uh, this court made it clear, for instance, in Papa Christu, that the fact that there was no, no core case, that an individual in law enforcement could create an, an offense out of, out of anything, uh, was the issue. But in looking at your standing, we have to look at what you've alleged about your client. And you've, you've alleged that they're alcoholics who can't control themselves, who drink all the time, and it's part of their disease. Uh, how could, with those facts, how could that not be a habitual drunkard? Your Honor, because the, the <laughs> law is, is is so vague that we do not know what conduct it comes under, to under any definition of continual, why wouldn't your clients fall within the definition of continual, regardless of how we uh, define it? Your Honor, I think probably in the sense that we were talking about before, if continual means... 24-7. 24-7. it means 24-7, and you've pled that your clients have an unending craving for alcohol and use alcohol... Why wouldn't it meet even the broadest definition of continual? Yes, Your Honor, because even, even if the law literally means 24-7, then even my clients, because they have a condition, they are not in a continual state of drinking. They are not daily. drinking all the what time. What if it just means daily? Daily, Your Honor. I think the, the same issue applies because Virginia doesn't give any notice on, on that issue, and my clients are not necessarily drunk every day. They weren't necessarily drunk every single day when they were That's addicted. what the pleading implies. Yes, Your Honor, I think... They're constantly using alcohol. Yes, Your Honor, I think that gets to the fact that we, we know that there has to be some other element that's being applied here to delineate. What's, what's what other, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. go ahead. What other element has to be included? Well, Your Honor, because we know that there are many more people than the 4,700 that have been interdicted, it can't, it can't mean anyone who consumes alcohol or generally consumes But we're looking at your clients for standing of purposes. We're not right. looking for uh, purposes of determining stand, uh, standing. We're not looking at other people. Yes, right. So we're confined to the facts pertinent to your clients. Yes, yes, Your Honor. And if I'm understanding the question, I think the fact is, is that there are many people who could be covered, but only a small subsection are. And the fact that there is something, some condition that's not in the law, some element that is taking that larger group and only singling out a smaller subsection of them, there is some element there that's not in the statute, and that's what we're talking about. It's a vagueness law in that sense, so but we don't know. it can't be vague if the conduct of which your client um, has been uh, participating in is, is squarely covered under the statute, then it can't be vague as to your clients, can it? Yes, Ron, I think, wow. I think that, we, again, we have to look at the loitering and vagrancy laws that this court has looked at. Again, the defendants in those cases before this court, no one denied that they could be 
they could be included in the definition of the crime. Well, let's try it another way. <coughs> were your clients surprised to hear that they were habitual drunkards? Uh, they couldn't have been surprised to hear that they were habitual drunkards, given your pleadings. Your Honor, it come to as a surprise to them. Your Honor, I, I have. I, I'm not sure if they were each individually surprised when when they were interdicted. Come on, your thing is they're, they're. And it's not just whether they're drinking 24 seven or even daily. It's they, according to the getting the shakes and the cravings, they are wanting to drink. They are trying to drink every day. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. It's but succeeding an awful lot of the time. Yes, Your Honor. And, and the question of whether a law is vague does not hinge on whether or not my clients were surprised. Well, that's the notice argument. Yes, Your Honor. But I think that the distinction is, as we heard the petitioner, the, the Commonwealth suggested over and over again that there's a harm component in this law. And I think all my clients would have been surprised to learn that they were considered a public harm. And there's well, no evidence. But that doesn't what the statute turns on. So to understand your position here, I think what you want us to do, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that you want the court to carve out, you're not attacking the statute across the board, it's just as to people who are homeless? Your Honor, in terms of the vagrants, in the in terms of the vagueness, we are challenging the law as being a vague law. Across the board? Yes, yes. Your Honor, the interdiction statute is vague. You, don't, you can't possibly have standing for non-homeless individuals, because your, your arguments very much depend on the status that they have to be habitual drunkards and in, in, they have to be in public. No one's complaining. Your Honor, I see my time has expired. May I answer? Please close. Mm -hmm. yeah, Your Honor, I, I, what we have here is we're still looking at specifically my clients, yes. Uh, but because such a small subgroup of individuals uh, have been prosecuted, and the majority of those are homeless and are alcoholics, what we're talking about is a law uh, that does predominantly apply only to my clients and people like them. And that's, that's what the law has been applied. That's how it's been used. And that fact makes it the type of vagrancy law this court has looked very closely at. For the foregoing reasons, we ask that you affirm the Four Circuits ruling. Thank you, Counsel. Rebuttal. <coughs> Justice Millett, as you recognized, uh, respondents' position on the Eighth Amendment would necessarily require that individuals, sex offenders, pedophiles, and others allegedly compelled by some sort of condition or status would have protection under some new Eighth Amendment defense of criminal helplessness. That is the only... Uh, Except the harm in those cases is very concrete, even though I tried to get around it. Virtual child porn is still pictures of children put together in different ways. So here the problem is, we, I guess I wasn't still clear from your opening argument, what the harm is are you just trying to help them not be alcoholics? Is that you're trying to protect them from their own addiction? Is that the harm when you say a harm to themselves? No, Your Honor. And to be clear on the vagueness issue, the statute would be constitutional even if there were no harm requirement. Now, there certainly is a harm requirement for the reasons that I have stated. But if you look at the Ninth Circuit's recent Ledesma Casino case, that court explicitly declined to consider whether or not a statute uh, that criminalized habitual drunkards or that applied to habitual drunkards, excuse me, uh, contained a harm requirement. But the Ninth Circuit only looked at that as applied to the plaintiffs there. And the plaintiffs, it was undisputed, were drinking a liter of tequila a day. It wasn't a facial challenge or something broader. To be clear, Your Honor, as respondents have pled their complaint, this is an as-applied challenge, not a facial challenge. Correct. But you seem to be arguing more of a facial just a moment ago. Well, Your Honor, it is not clear from the record whether or not these individuals have been, say, convicted for public intoxication before. But we do know that a state judge considered their past convictions. Uh, and we do know, based off of their pleading, they functionally are always violating public intoxication laws. So Justice Millett, to your question, that is where a harm comes from. These individuals are constantly violating public intoxication laws. That is the only upshot of- Wait, so then harm is no limiting principle. So if, I thought you were using harm as a limiting principle, but if the harm is we declare you to be a criminal and it's we're here to protect you and the public from yourself and the protection is because you're a criminal, then you're just, the argument's just tautological. Well, Your Honor, I had thought there was some actual external harm you were trying to prevent. Well, Your Honor, yes, these, to be clear, I'm not saying that these individuals have been convicted of public intoxication and I'm not saying that the state is only interested in protecting them, the state is interested in protecting others as well. But for the reasons that I mentioned, the statute does not. What, I guess, like, I'm sorry, I keep trying here. 
Protecting them from what? Well, Your Honor, the state can protect these individuals, as you said, from their own alcoholism and the harm that comes with that. Uh, the state regularly protects individuals from themselves. You, can you throw them in jail? That sounds like a great way to treat somebody who's got an uncontrollable addiction. Well, Your Honor, there are multiple ways, and Virginia can take a belt and suspenders approach. May I briefly answer your question? Please conclude. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, so Virginia offers drug treatment programs and drug courts and other things like that. However, Virginia has decided that those programs are insufficient, and for that reason, it has made it also a crime for an individual to violate an interdiction order through his or her continued alcohol abuse. And but the so harm is not part of the definition. Is Are you saying the harm is the policy reason behind this, or the harm has to be part of the definition of habitual drunkard? Our position is that the harm uh, is implicitly and explicitly recognized in the statute through the shown himself requirement and the categories of interdiction. All right, thank you, counsel. We understand your argument. Thank you to both counsel. The case just argued is submitted for decision by the court. We will retire to deliberate. All rise. The Supreme Court is the United
Like you drink beer and you kind of you get like girls in bikinis and it's like I got home like, last summer like I literally like got up to go running and there's literally some girls like going by what is happening <laughs>
They just stand in the hall. I was kind of hoping they're just like, Please be seated. Before we announce our decision, we would like to commend both advocates for your grasp of the facts and the law, your poise, your presentation, your unflappable nature as we peppered you with questions. <laughs> Very well done. Um, after we've announced our decision, we would like to take, the, to take the opportunity to tell you about our observations of how well you did in specific detail. But for now, we do announce that the winner of the 2020 Cup Award is Donovan Stone. Congratulations. It was a, thank you, it was a very difficult decision. You all both did an excellent job and we commend you for your dedication and commitment to developing your advocacy skills. We can tell how hard you worked on developing your arguments and we were very impressed with the amount of work you put into your arguments and your incredible delivery of those arguments to us. So with that, I'll turn to Judge Malik to give you some specific comments. Okay, well great. And it is very true that you were both spectacular. I don't know if you have family and friends here or watching him on video. Uh, parents, money very well spent um, on tuition and effort, and your students are working very, very hard. Um, uh, Mr. Stone, you had a really organized introduction, which is an important, very important way of starting uh, oral arguments. You stood, did anyone notice he kind of stood his ground when we were hitting him with everything we could? Um, and, and you knew when to kind of move the argument along. So, well, even if it's criminal, da, 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 and that's a hard thing sometimes to do because you've been planning and planning to, to debate, but you have to know when to move to reinforce your position, and that's really, really hard um, to do. Um, and at the end of the time, you wound up properly, and, um, and then your rebuttal, and it's not fair, you didn't get the chance, I'm sure you would have been just as good. Um, but you sort of came up, you listened, you paid attention, you met us where we were, you sort of hit what was a positive point for you, and then emphasized that, and you had a really good closing with your drug courts, so, um, I thought that was good. You might have even wanted to work that in earlier. Um, I think you know, the hardest thing for both of you is um, when you have moot cases, you don't have all the record information you want, and it's hard to give the more precise answers you would want to give in these, and we understand that's the nature of a moot court, and you'll be much more satisfied in real client cases because you'll have, all, or it'll be your job to have all the information you need to answer those questions. Um, Mr. Starr, fantastic. This is, I mean, if we could let you both grab one side of that trophy and do it <laughs> together, it's like Harry Potter, right? So, um, move, it's, it's a teleport. Um, uh, but you, you know, you were also, you came out and you had your own way of opening. You know, yours was like a government would be, here's our, here's our reasons. And you came out with, look, here's the problem. Um, and that's a courageous way to start because it's, uh, it's legal, but it's a little more, it's also more what's working. Uh, and you did that very, very well, had great, great eye contact. And uh, at one point, and I wish I had been, I was having pen issues up here, <laughs> you couldn't notice, but you not only got an adverse question, but you did the hardest thing it is for an advocate to do. And that is transition to positive ground. Uh, and you did that in the way that advocates who've been arguing for years and years and years aren't able to do. And I used to argue in the Supreme Court and in courts of appeals. I know how hard it is, and you have incredible skills. And I hope you will continue to use them, and I would very much, for both of you, love to see you in the DC Circuit at any point. Please come on down. Just any? Well, you were welcome in the Seventh Circuit. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, though, you get to take the cup, but you don't get to take it home, <laughs> travel around with it, and take it out tonight. So just remember that. Don't, don't do that. Um, you were both really terrific. You should be proud of yourselves. I could tell the, the hard work that went into it, and you really knew the record as well, which is so, so important. Sometimes 
lawyers come in at the appellate level and think, oh, it's the appellate court, we just have to know what the law is. But that's not true. And you both really, really knew the record. Continue with that. That is so important to successful arguments. Um, Mr. Stone, you you were unflappable. We were giving it to you, all three of us, at the same time at one point, And you were respectful in answering it and, and not talking over us, even though we were talking over each other at times. <laughs> um, you did a, a very good job of being patient and waiting and then answering all of our questions, which is not always easy to do. Sometimes you forget what we're, we're asking. You also did a very nice job of pushing back when we were trying to push you into something of saying, well, respectfully, I disagree. And you, you can't cave, and you didn't. So did a very good job, and a, a good job of, of maneuvering. At one point, we were pushing you on the, isn't this a, a civil? Why is this? Or isn't this quasi-criminal? And you were saying it was no civil. And finally, you said, well, even if it is quasi-criminal, I still win because, and that's what you should do. So great job. And Mr. Starr, you, you have a great demeanor about you and are very, very calm. And <coughs> even though we were, again, pushing on, on you all at the same time, at, at one point you just stood there calmly, waited for the questions, and, and answered them, which is terrific. That's hard to do, uh, hard for lawyers to do. You did an excellent job. And I also agree you maneuvered well. Um, you didn't you didn't get stuck on one point even though we were kept trying to bring you back to it you were maneuvering and trying to move along I also liked how we spent most of our time questioning him on the due process issue and the notice issue but I liked how you started with the eighth amendment and you came in rather than following what we just spent a lot of time on said hey look at this argument I I, I thought that was very effective so nice job I agree with everything that's been said. And the thing that was most impressive to me was that your arguments flowed so fluidly without any notes at all or any that I could see. So <laughs> I was really impressed with that because you it's obvious that you spend a lot of time preparing. I like both of your styles. And I think when you're appearing as an advocate, it's important to be yourself and not try to advocate in a way that's foreign to you. And that came across with both of you, that you were very authentic in the way you presented your arguments and were able to kind of steer us into where you wanted to talk, even though we were trying to take you someplace else. And that's very important to do, because oftentimes the questions that the judges have will steer you away from what you're actually trying to impart. So there is a skill that's needed in order to get back on track and, and have the judges to pay attention to the points that you want to emphasize. And both of you did that very skillfully with a great deal of grace and respect. And that's, that's something that's really, really important in terms of the advocacy. So we congratulate both of you on your effective advocacy and hope that you will continue to um, hone your skills. And we would also welcome you in the ninth circuit. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, unless there's something else, we are in recess. Mm -hmm. <laughs>